Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, in this talk, we are going to. Uh, it's uh, Mark is mainly going to talk about using solometer data to detect not just fraudulent. We will talk about fraudulent activity in an OpenStack cluster, but this could also do other things as we'll see. So uh, it's a joint collaboration with Mark, who's th the main uh, per person and uh, him, who did this as part of his master's thesis and while he was at Cisco uh, as an intern for, and uh, Professor Julio uh, is the computer security lecturer at University of Kent and I, I work for Cisco. And originally this, the whole space uh, of problems started as a special project within Cisco where we have a small advanced technology group looking at few, uh, next generation problem that uh, OpenStack will face. And our problem was how do we optimize uh, uh, big data and IO intensive workloads on OpenStack? And we've had a series of talks in Atlanta where we showed initial results on how we do that. And we've talked about smart placement, interactive visualizations, ins uh, gathering insights from accelerometer data, log data, and a bunch of things that we did in Atlanta. We had four talks in Atlanta. Um, so I wouldn't want to repeat all those things we've done. But essentially, what the, the high level question uh, as a part of uh, investigating uh, all these optimizations of, uh, big d uh, for big data on OpenStack, the fundamental question is, what is happening in my cloud? And this is important. Uh, for security purposes, for um, operational purposes, a bunch of use cases. And uh, it, uh, and actually, um, uh, Mark then went back uh, to his university and he, he decided to pursue um, follow-up problems and say that, okay, so if we know how, if we can answer the following question that, how do we figure out what's happening in, uh, in our cloud based on logs and metrics? Uh, how do we use this uh, uh, knowledge to detect fraudulent activities? So what is a fraudulent activity? It's a, there's a whole space of activities that could be fraudulent. First things that come to your mind would be DDoS attack, and then uh, figuring out if somebody's doing something wrong, like you know, ru uh, running a Bitcoin mining uh, job, and in general, you could even use this to uh, the same techniques to discover noisy neighbors, which is a big problem in shared uh, uh, virtual infrastructure. So with that, I'll ha hand over to Mark. Thank you, Zebo. Is my micro working? Yeah. OK. So the first step here was to uh, decide what we consider to be uh, accepted workloads and what we consider to be fraudulent activities. So. Uh, Regular jobs would be uh, using uh, distributed systems or running web applications in the cloud uh, or even scientific calculations or hosting databases. Uh, but is this everything that's happening in our cloud? No, uh, there's many other stuff that can happen. Not all of it's so nice and so acceptable. We can also have DDoS attacks. Uh, we can have Bitcoin mining, which is quite popular and it's actually quite bad for our classes as it reduces their uh, working life quite a lot. So we really don't want this. So the next question is, how can we detect these activities? Uh, we came up with a very, very simple method which uh, tries to use co a component already existing in OpenStack, which is Celometer. Uh, we use Celometer to get billing information. So we use this data and we are going to try to reuse it for something else. So we started, uh, that, that's the formula we use. We use Celometer, we added some magical machine learning, and with that we got uh, real-time uh, fraudulent activity detection. Uh, real-time is in parentheses because of course you can do it offline, you can save the data, data and do it later experiment, but it's also possible to do it in real-time. So we divide the, the method in three steps. It's collect, then classify, and then counteract, take in action. First one, collect. That's where Celometer comes into play. Uh, Celometer provides us with many different meters. We wanted to use the, the minimal amount, only the default ones, not changing uh, too many configurations. So we kept with CPU utilization, uh, the network information, and disk information, uh, which um, is privacy-friendly data. 
you, you get aggregates, you get numbers, you don't have access to the user's data, so you are not spying on them, which is quite important at this. And also, uh, for the purpose of the investigation, we changed the collection rate to five seconds, so we could experiment with different rates. In production, you probably have a bit more than that. So this is the, the data once it's processed. So we've got, of course, the headers. The first column will be the, the type of activity, the, 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 uh, the class. And then we have uh, each line represents five seconds of activity in our cluster. Each line represents also one bit of resource, so let's say one BM or one volume. So what kind of jobs did we use for our experiment? We tried to keep it simple, not use too, ma too many jobs. So we divided them in three categories. First, general workloads. We chose Hadoop running Highbench. Highbench is a benchmark suit, which is quite complete. It has uh, real-life uh, uh, situations such as page rank, but it also stresses all the different components of Hadoop. So it gives us quite a, quite a lot of data, quite diverse. And then, uh, since we decided to focus on detecting Bitcoin, we, which is quite CPU intensive, then we added a CPU intensive accept operation, which could be a, a scientific calculation. In this case, it was just uh, the Linux stress tool, stressing the CPU. So then we have fraudulent activities and failures. We had failures because we wanted to see if we could detect something there, see if it worked. So we had an internal DDoS attack, which was a, a very, very simple uh, ping float DDoS attack between two VMs, uh, well, several VMs from inside the same tenant to overload the network a little bit. And then uh, mining Bitcoin and Litecoin. And for, for failures, we had a physical network failure. So once we had uh, decided all these uh, jobs, we collected data. And when we had the data, we were able to plot it. So let's see how the data looks like. Uh, this is the plot for uh, the Hadoop job. And as I said, Highbench has a quite a diverse range of activities. So as you can see, we are plotting the CPU utilization versus the network outgoing package rate. It, we have quite a lot of points. It's quite sparse. So it can be, uh, we can get guess from here. It can easily be confused with other type of jobs. So let's move to the next one, the, D, the CPU intensive one. Here, of course, uh, I don't know, if, yeah, I think you can see it. The CPU uh, is extremely used. Actually, since OpenStack is by default configured to over, over allocate resources, uh, we are using more than 100%. And we are not using too much network. We are, yeah, we are using some network, but not too much, and disk as well. So now the, the DDoS attack. Of course, network is extremely high. And we are also using a fair amount of CPU, although not much. This one seems to be quite focused on up there, so it seems to be easy to detect. Next one uh, is the Bitcoin mining and Litecoin mining. Initially, we tried to treat them as separate classes, try to distinguish between Litecoin and Bitcoin, but this proved to be impossible. So we merged them into a single class, uh, treated as cri cryptocurrency mining. And as you can see, we are using um, quite a lot of CPU. And also, if you uh, look at the vertical stripes, we can say that there's network patterns. We're using, uh, we're repeating the same size of packets several times. So uh, finally, we've got the network down, which is the least important. There's actually nothing to see here. It's uh, zero network and almost no CPU, just a little bit of CPU because the VM is running. For that, we just unplug the network cable, very simple. So let's see how they look like when they are together, or together in a single plot. So that's all the data together. As we can guess from here, it's going to be fairly easy to detect the DDoS. Hadoop is going to probably present some problems as it overlaps with Bitcoin, and also Bitcoin uh, overlaps with a, a very CPU-intensive operation. So I'm going, uh, I'm going to hand it uh, to Julio now, who's going to uh, talk about step two. Thanks. Um, so, as you saw there, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, of course, we're only showing here two dimensions. We have a little bit more than that, but uh, the problem is not uh, completely trivial. In some cases, yeah, it's pretty easy, but in others, you know, it's far from trivial. So, we have to apply uh, some sort of machine learning algorithm that will, you know, outsmart us at classifying. Uh, but, uh, 
which one? I mean, we have plenty of opportunities here. We can use some sort of neural network, uh, support vector machines, which is, by the way, my favorite one. And the one I, I was betting my money on, the, you know, performing better. Uh, we can use some of the approaches like random forest, naive bias, on, or whatever. So, um, and of course, the idea is to connect this, any of these, the best performing of this with uh, you know the data data collection and uh, you know to to generate some sort of uh, pipeline there. And uh, for that, we in this particular case used uh, well relatively new tool, machine learning tool, which is free, uh, developed by um, a group of academics in uh, the University of uh, Ljubljana in Slovenia. And uh, it presents some advantages of a, you know, other perhaps better known set of uh, machine learning um, algorithms. Perhaps you're, you know, better, more familiar with uh, Weka or um, Scikit-Learn or something like that. But uh, Orange was our, um, you know, set of algorithms of choice in this particular occasion. And why? Because we can do this. Uh, it's really... A f very, very easy to, to use. And, uh, you know, we wanted to propose you to use something that uh, really had almost no entry level uh, prerequisites. And this is really easy to use. Uh, it's something, it's the first, I would say, um, powerful enough data mining um, tool that offers some sort of drag and, do uh, drag and drop uh, abilities. So you just pick uh, some of these and you drag and drop them, and magically they work. Well, not magically, of course. I mean, uh, underlying you have a lot of uh, Python and a lot of C++, and <laughs> but um, still it's pretty good. And this, uh, basically what this shows here is, well, the entry, the, the data entries in here. Um, we use a number of different, uh, you know, algorithms because we are, you know, algorithm, uh, agnostic, we just uh, try them and, and hope for the best. And we have uh, used some of the natural approaches like SVM, support vector machines, principal component analysis, random forest, knife bays, and logistic re re regression, neural networks, and so forth. And then you can test and compare them and produce very nice looking you know, output, uh, you know, checking the advantages uh, of them from rock uh, curves to confusion matrix. So it's a pretty nice tool and it's free. And uh, I mean, I'm not related in any way to, to that, but I highly recommend its usage. Anyway, so after <coughs> some trials, we um, got this. <coughs> it's interesting to see here that uh, uh, all of them perform, you know, quite well, I would say. But there was one that really outperformed the rest, and this is uh, the random forest algorithm. Um, random forest is some sort of ensemble uh, learning algorithm that uses multiple decision trees, and that outputs the, the mode of uh, you know, the classification by these decision trees. It's kind of a you know, hot uh, algorithm in data mining, and it consistently, I mean, for a variety of problems, um, you know, gives you good results. Not by any means that the rest uh, do poorly. For example, you have here, you know, just a simple classical all good neural network achieving nearly 80%, which is pretty good, uh, particularly after, you know, after only five seconds of uh, data. Um, just to let you know, we use here tenfold cross-validation, which is a kind of, uh, you know, technical term in data mining to say basically that we are not cheating here, that we are using uh, data but not memorizing it, that we are not overfitting or, you know, overtraining uh, on the, you know, the, the data we have so that, uh, you know, we, we use some sort of cherry picking. Not the case with tenfold cross-validation, uh, meaning that these results are, can be generalized and can be, you know, uh, proved to be useful. So yes, this uh, high value here is exactly 
0.5 accuracy, which is you know pretty good. I was uh, myself pretty uh, surprised. Let's put it mildly. So okay, we can classify. Um, let's take action. Uh, you know, once we got this mostly correct classification. So th the thing, of course, is after running this, deploying this, and running this, and getting some results. The idea is to tr trigger some sort of an alarm for you know, further investigation. Uh, you know, something fishy probably is going on, so you need to put some extra time and checking what's going on. Perhaps you, know, you can automate some responses, like decrease the quota, or even stop the, the resource, or even block the user altogether. That might be a little bit, you know, perhaps, of an o overreaction, but you know, depending on how you have configured your, um, your system, it might be um, the correct one. And you will have uh, at least a, you know, a good base, a good um, case to make for these actions to be taken. Anyway, so uh, the good thing about this approach is that it works pretty well with uh, a small number of workloads. Of course, you can, you can say, hey, basically you're classifying whatever enters your pipeline in five different classes, uh, from DDoS to you know, uh, cryptocurrency mining to network failure, only five. How will this you know, escalate if you, instead of just classifying um, into five different labels, you want to use 20 or 100? Of course, you won't achieve the same results. That's what, that should be pretty obvious. Um, we haven't tested yet how the performance uh, decreases with more labels, but um, you know, I'm pretty confident that it will decrease gracefully and it won't just you know collapse. Um, the good thing about this is that it enables very quick and very reliable uh, detection of something weird going on on my cloud. Can we improve these results? Um, yes, we can improve that. Um, a little bit, at least, by using something of a meta classifier. Uh, I mean, the, the word is probably, you know, too, uh, you know, too much of a word for the basic idea, which is repeating this many, many, many times after, you know, an hour and taking decisions not every five seconds, but, you know, collect yourself a, a after an hour and see what's going on. With a 97.5 uh, uh, percentage of you know, accuracy, uh, after five seconds, you can really approach 100%, get very, very close to 100% <laughs> after an hour. And uh, particularly taking into account that many of these activities won't be running just for five seconds. I mean, if someone is abusing your cloud and is mining uh, Litecoins, there's really not m much of a point for just, you know, mining uh, for five seconds. That really wouldn't uh, generate a lot of profit in general. Uh, people will be mining for hours, days, weeks, and so forth. So, um, you know, <laughs> 90, you have to see these figures, 97.5 in, in context. Of course, random classification, you know, uh, will give you a 20% because we have five uh, labels. 97.5 is pretty good. Uh, there's also a case to be made that we don't need more labels. Um, you know, getting more or slightly better classification will be probably a little bit of, uh, um, you know, a little bit creepy uh, for our um, users. We will know a little bit too much what's going on, and probably that's not healthy, particularly in this, you know, post Snowden era. So, I'm talking about privacy. Um, I think this is very important. This technique, with all its, you know, pros and, and limitations, the good point is, is not in invasive at all. We're just, you know, milking data that we will collect anyway, because we need it for building purposes, okay? So we are just reusing this kind of uh, minimal data required for billing. Uh, we are not 
spying on our customers in any way. That's you know the minimal set of data that we need. If we can mill that and, and, and put that to good use, as we prove in here, that's great. But we are not inviting anyone's privacy here. Uh, on the other hand, that also has some advantages, uh, meaning that if everything is encrypted, we also can use this, this technique. Of course, with some you know, slight modifications, because you know, the data, the amount of data sent and received, if you're using encryption, uh, could be slightly modified by padding, but you know, it will be a really small difference. And, um, and also, you can try your, uh, you know, your machine learning algorithms with this encrypted data instead of uh, with plain text as we did in here. So, I mean, many advantages are not to be um, too privacy invasive, I would say. Of course, if we use more meters, instead of this minimal set of standards, we will get a better classification, that's for sure. But uh, we believe, I mean, in our humble opinion, this is the right trade-off. Not too invasive, we are not doing anything particularly you know, creepy, something that will put off our users, and at the same time we are you know, getting or gathering as much intelligence as, as we possibly can. So, uh, yeah. I think that's all. So if you have uh, now any questions. <coughs> Were you concerned about, you know, <coughs> taking non-trivial actions in relation to these data, given the rate of false positives? Even though, you know, with the random forest approach, it seems relatively small, you still got 2.5%. Yeah. So if the chemist temper measure was still a resort, <laughs> Well, in the real it? world, uh, what you would do is when you detect something's going wrong, you would further investigate then. You can use more tools such as network inspection tools. Then you can invade his privacy if necessary, yeah. investigate more, and then take action. So the idea is this is a first <laughs> yes, it's an easy way and a cheap way to detect, uh, to raise a flag. There might be something going wrong there. And uh, yeah, another point I for forgot to mention is, um, I mean, we can, you can see this as a you know, practical approach that you can implement yourself in, in, in your systems, but uh, you, know, you can see this as, as customers and saying, hey, why this particular company is getting more data? Uh, ah, they are claiming that it's, it's for security purposes. No, I will say no, because these guys you know, showed that with the minimal billing data, uh, they should be more than capable to, you know, to, to do at least uh, a first classification of uh, right or wrong. So, I mean, hopefully you can use this to, to say, no, I'm not disclosing this data or I don't want to engage into this contract because it's too invasive or whatever. Also, let's say you are a user of OpenStack. You don't need to rely on your cloud provider to, to do that. You could um, get your own cellular metadata and run this locally on your company or uh, in an extra VM and monitor your own services. Let's say you have a website, you could monitor for uh, zombie machines using that. And you wouldn't, th you wouldn't uh, rely on your cloud provider offering the service or having to pay them extra. That's a good point. Sometimes your services would have been compromised without you knowing. You're paying for computation, uh, hopefully achieving something which is you know, profitable for you, but then your system has been compromised and without you knowing, you're mining bitcoins for someone in well, whatever the country, I don't want to, to name countries. <laughs> um, that's not really very good. And this could offer, if not you know, the final solution, at least some hints that something fishy is going on. Uh, not for this project, no. Uh, we've done that in the past, but not, not for this project. We're trying to use only the default data uh, you could find in Ice, Ice House in Cilometer. Uh, 
well, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that uh, from uh, if you use OpenStack, you can access to your tenants data in Celometer. Yeah. At least I think you come from the dashboard. Um, am I right? Yeah. Uh, so if you 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 can uh, pull the data uh, every minute, every two minutes, or every hour if you want, get the data, analyze it, or you could even yeah you could automate it, but you'd have to download the data if you are running it outside the cloud. Training set was um, it was about thirty six thousand sample. It was fifty hours worth of data. Yeah. Um, I do not in the slides. I can show you afterwards if you want. I have the the confusion matrix. Okay then. Thank you everyone, and that's the end. Thanks.